Thanks for the invitation. Sorry, I can't be there. Um, these thoughts come from a recent publication, which you can see here. Um, you can go back a slide, next one. So um, we can perhaps talk about that again a bit later. So um, to write about Stellark is also to engage with concepts such as post-humanism, cybernetics, and can we go back to the first slide? Thanks. John, are you, are you operating the slides? Yes. Yeah, okay. So just don't still on that first one. And we're talking about um, the suspensions today. So post-humanism for me is a discourse that opens up the significance of Stellark's opus for a contemporary readership. But there's always an aesthetic access to his work, uh, as you'll see when he talks which is not exhausted by um, the kinds of theories we throw at him. He is as much an artist making works of art as a designer of technical systems that whose aesthetic value is never secondary to the design principles he's exploring. He is at the same time an artist deploying his body, the most fundamental of tools, in the construction of the aesthetic situation. And he's also a kind of experienced designer, experimenting with diverse platforms for embodied being in the world. So a diversity of frames will be needed to engage in a meaningful way with such a multimedia practice. But I'll focus on the challenge his opus has consistently made to the understanding of the interface between human and non-human, and in particular to the affordances of the post-human. Post-human dramaturgy is the next section um, and in this sense, the post-human understanding of embodiment as foundational to being in the world is a, an ideal frame for the practice of an artist who has continually explored what this experience looks and feels like. And while it doesn't explain the particular ways he approaches this in his performances, in other words, the aesthetic, even dramaturgical decisions he makes, everything from how many hooks to insert for a suspension to how long one can remain suspended, it remains a useful way into the meaning of this body of work. Um, and post-human dramaturgy might be uh, an extension of some of the arguments we, Peter, Helena and I wrote in this book, uh, New Media Dramaturgy, which um, was a recent uh, project that we, we've just completed. But going back to N. Catherine Hale's influential book, which I, I, I still use for, for this discussion, how we became post-human. Can we go to the next slide now, please? Virtual Bodies in Cybernetics, Literature and Informatics. It was published in 1999. We find four key arguments to uh, the formation of this discourse. Firstly, she argues that post-humanism privileges informational pattern over material presence, so that biological embodiment is not viewed as a fixed origin or even a destiny of life, but rather as an accident of history, in other words. If embodiment is contingent and subject to creative mutation, then there is a role for artists such as Stella to suggest new designs or design principles for this future mode of existence. Secondly, Hales relegates consciousness to the status of a minor sideshow, which is a phrase I've always liked, Recalling Stellark's own frequently cited rejection of that Cartesian split subject, mind-body, and his refusal to discursively engage with the notion of the subject. Thirdly, the post-human body is viewed as a manipulable prosthesis, so that extending or altering the body with other processes, as Stellark has done throughout his career, can be regarded as the continuation of an ongoing process that begins before birth. Finally, the post-human view constructs the human being and can be seamlessly articulated with intelligent technology. This may have sounded futuristic even as recently as the late 90s, but it now appears an accurate description of our cybernetic way of life, where there is scarcely any trace of the sense of the self as separate from the technology that supports us as behaviours and expressions articulate seamless, seamlessly with mobile technology. Can I have the next slide, please? So cybernetic aesthetics um, is another way of, of thinking about Stellark's work that I, I think is quite productive. 
And again, going back now quite a long way to Donna Haraway's um, fabulous work in Simeon, Cyborgs and Women, The Reinvention of Nature, and particularly her Cyborg Manifesto, in which, again, we read uh, an interesting convergence of the post-human view of gender and power and in which she identifies a shift um, really from representational aesthetics to you know, simulation, broadly speaking, or, uh, or performance, um, a kind of non-representational aesthetic as it worked there. And I think that's very much the case with Stellark uh, as well. He's not really representing uh, issues or problems. He's not representing cybernetics. He's reproducing it. He's simulating it. He's embedding it in the body. So Stellark's artworks embed technology in the body and vice versa to produce behaviours and gestures which extend its performance parameters. The performances are the result of the combination of all the elements in the system and in this way are perfect illustrations of the principle of cybernetic existence which looks at not inputs uh, of the organic versus machine kind but looks at the totality of the system in terms of its feedback loops and its, uh, its outputs and its performance, which are not attributable to either the organic or the machinic input, but to the system as a whole. Um, <clears throat> as in that, uh, you can see in that event for anti-Copernicus robot from Tokyo in 1985. And by the way, Stellark's slides are much better than mine, so um, he, he will, uh, I think he's got a better version of this particular one uh, in his talk. Uh, so we can come back to that. But um, uh, he has the he's the body mic'd up. He has the third arm there. He has the laser eye projecting as well, which is a beautifully kind of Artodian uh, aesthetic, I think, where uh, the eye isn't receiving but producing images. Um, so cybernetics, like the post-human, not only accurately contextualizes the meaning of Stellark's performance art but also there's also a discourse used by uh, Stellark himself to frame his own practice in texts, manifestos, interviews and statements, his famous statements such as, we've always been hooked up to technologies and have always been prosthetic bodies, augmented and extended. All his performance work involves a, a subtle dance and sometimes robust conversation with technologies. So his, his notion that the human body is now the prosthetic device by which the machines we have created transact their business, sampling, processing, distributing our data, is based on his experiences of collaboration with them. The laser eyes that produce light rather than receiving it, the sound designs of Rainer Lintz, uh, who's a long-term collaborator with Stella, using the amplified rhythms of Stellark's own blood in circulation and heart beating, to provide an electronic soundtrack to the performances is a sometimes overlooked feature of the work, but which highlights this kind of essential message around cybernetic um, server mechanism and interconnection. Uh, next slide, please. So we've always developed prostheses that have helped supplement, or in Stellark's words, augment and extend our own embodiment such as the scaffolds and cranes um, he used to elevate his body in the suspension of that, uh, but also most, I think, notably really in the, uh, in, with the third arm and the, uh, ex the robotics experiments um, where the technology was on the body. Um, the suspension events seen another way show that machines have their own way of doing things and are happy to use our embodied existence as vehicles for their own strategies, as a kind of new materialist element, which has always been latent in Stellark's language and in his work. Uh, his conception of the body as an evolutionary architecture, his, his words, cooperation and awareness in the world, de-emphasises the subject and reinforces the effect of sentient matter, which is one of the sort of core elements of the new materialist framework. This modular image of a body based on components that can be exchanged or transplanted also suggests a suitable new materialist approach. Uh, in this sense, the familiar notion of a singular organic entity 
is obsolete, as in Stellark's famous obsolete body manifesto uh, adopted by French artist Orlan for her own very different project. Can I have the next slide, please? Stellark's performances, and especially the suspensions, drive the viewer in opposite directions. In one, they appear to be the new materialist assemblages of organic and technical matter framed by the artist as demonstrations of a cybernetic mode of existence. But in another direction, they are also readable as a kind of liminoid ritual, symbolic acts and gestures at the threshold of major social shifts that might offer access to a different way of seeing these shifts. As such, they are life crisis rituals, in the language of Victor Turner. And I know Stellark hates this um, particular reading, but <laughs> we must go on. Um, symbolic acts that offer a response to and a way of coping with sudden and significant upheavals in society. While this fundamentally humanist proposition is not the way Stellark sees his work, the life crisis of the body remains a powerful hermeneutic to activate the cultural meaning of this kind of body art practice. This body finds itself without sympathetic environments, a major technological innovation, accelerating beyond the capacities of the organism to adapt. It's a life crisis of the species in which the body itself operates liminally. Stellark places his body as a metonym or model for the human body on the threshold between technologies, between what we thought it was and what it is on the point of becoming. An instance which exemplifies this strategy and suggests the continuity of Stellark's suspension events with his more obviously cybernetic performances of the 1990s and after is this event for the port structure uh, from 1979 at Tamura Gallery in Tokyo. Um, and it is interesting how this body of work, these, the um, suspension events, was developed in Japan uh, alongside the technical experiments with robotics that Stellark was also undertaking uh, at Waseda University. Uh, and these were, for him, you know, uh, related projects. And I, I think the, the language of what we're using here of cybernetics and the post human is, is the kind of link between them. In this event for support structure, Delac's body was restrained and held between those two wooden planks and then suspended from a simple four-pole structure, which he used quite a lot uh, in the suspension events of that period. He endured this environment without pause for 75 hours. Here the technologies are very simple, poles and planks of wood. They're used in a way which illustrates the forces that constrain physicality in the world. So like the other 25 suspension events, the artist's body is placed between earth and sky to dramatise the effects of gravity. This durational event also removes the body from the circuits of ordinary sense perception and daily life for over three days. It was by all reports an exhausting and extremely difficult performance, and it's no surprise then that critics and writers seeking to understand the work are drawn to connections with shamanism and rites of passage, but this is only part of the story. Can I have the next slide, please? In, in these works, to, to me, and again, apologies for the quality of these, um, of these images, um, the uh, suspension events are a kind of critical design project as much as a performance project. The 26 separate performances in which the body was set, penetrated with shark hooks and then suspended from a variety of mobile and immobile structures. And they remain as hardcore an illustration of what looks like transgressive ritual as you could wish for. But as he has had to explain on numerous occasions, Bellac broke through his own skin not to experience a transcendental break from everyday consciousness, but to uncover the body's potentials for spatial arrangement. Because having tried alternate methods, involving straps and other cables, the simplest and best design solution was to insert the hooks through the skin. This also had the advantage of enabling the testing and dramatising, the, the dramaturgy, if you like, of gravity's force on the skin and for performing real physical interconnections with technologies, however uncomfortable and shocking in appearance. The hooks were dramatur dramaturgical and compositional tools rather than instruments of torture. Uh, next slide, thanks. Okay. Um, 
Little sections called lines of flight. In the post-human, uh, Rosie Braidotti outlines a case for a post-human ethics and subjectivity based, as she says, on a nomadism of movement and speed, lines of sedimentation and lines of flight. It's a familiar deleuze guattari quote, but it's doubly apt in this case, as the Stalag would develop this practice of a kind of flight in which his body was suspended above the ground, sometimes high above the ground, on a wire or an industrial crane. While most of the suspension events were not performed for large audiences, but were in a manner of much of the most important performance art of the 20th century, if we think of Chris Burden, Vito Acconci, and Mike Parr's performances for film, these were performed for camera, not for public performances, uh, mostly. But in this one, the street suspension in New York, now can I have the next slide, please? Um, and the next one was the city suspension in Copenhagen. Uh, these were, these attracted very large audiences. In the case of the street suspension in New York over East 11th Street, the body was suspended uh, for 30 minutes as it crossed between the buildings above the street, but police stopped the performance after 12 minutes and the artist was arrested for endangering the public. Um, as Deleuze and Guattari would often attest, the line of flight always ends in capture. Uh, but it's interesting that... That's a kind of durational performance in the purest sense. It had a, a dramaturgy, a structure, 30 minutes, but uh, after 12 minutes, it was brought to a halt. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in those events that have uh, a kind of their own organic duration to them, despite the you know, best plans of the artist. Um, can I have the next slide, please? The, the very next year in Copenhagen, 1984, the artist received permission from the authorities and the director of the Royal Theatre. You can see the gargoyles on the roof there, the Royal Theatre. Um, to perform a suspension with a crane. And in this case, the police actually provided assistance with crowd control. The video documentation, which I'm sorry we can't see, but which is absolutely sensational, shows the insertion of the hooks and the body being raised by the crane above the spectators. It's really quite incredible footage. Is there a more spectacular and unnerving sight in all of contemporary performance art than this naked body attached to an industrial crane 56 metres above the ground? There's a sequence in the video where the body flies past these winged beasts fixed to the roof of the Royal Theatre. A statement on the changes in art over the centuries, representation, dissimulation and performance. And... Also, on um, achievement over the purely imagined. So those gargoyles were representations of flight, which is now being achieved. Such an image would be a suitable testament to the work of this artist who is concerned with exactly this issue, of demonstrating ideas rather than simply illustrating them. Uh, next slide. Delac offers the following typically brief account. After being hoisted up 30 metres, all that could be heard was the whooshing of the wind, the whirring of the crane motors and the creaking of the skin. This piece was of 24 minutes duration, in which the crane driver, who had to receive approval from the union to be involved in the event, moved Stellart's body through four rotations of the crane arm through the 180 degrees of movement of the arm. And Stellark also noted that his body was constantly vibrating from the effects of the wind and swinging and spinning on its axis. Um, levitation is, of course, one of the oldest tricks in the history of magic as a performance practice. But in these events, Stella translates levitation from this history of popular entertainment and makes a component of a different kind of critical design practice, one which asserts the pleasures of technical capacity and knowledge over illusion and magic. But the city suspension above the Royal Theatre has its own magical qualities, the magic of revelation rather than deception. For the organisers of the festival, 
It was perhaps also a traumatic and terrifying ordeal as they were unable to contact the artist for the duration of the event and the pre-organised hand signals couldn't be used as Stellart couldn't use his arms. But he was concerned for his safety as the wind was making the cables hum and vibrate and he was a long way from the ground with no means of communication. When the train returned him safely to the ground, he was asked how he had felt and he advised the assembled organisers and assistants that he didn't like height. Well, next slide, please. The Stellux critics often want to know what kind of body he's claiming to represent as obsolete. Is it a white male body? What about other bodies? Women's bodies? Bodies of colour? He makes no claim on this level and focuses only on affect and agency. In this sense, it's properly a post-human discourse he's activating rather than a humanist one. In the suspension, he produces, as he says, a body that neither thinks nor expresses emotions. The body is exposed as obsolete, empty, absent from its own agency and performing largely involuntarily. A suspended body is a zombie body. The very notion of body as a subjective style is kind of suspended. It's in an in-between state in these works. Belloc's famously impersonal way of speaking about his experiences as, as an artist can be disconcerting, but this is part of the strategy in his work, to present an alternative notion of what it means to be embodied. If I look at Stellark in this 2012 Ear on Arm suspension at Scott Livesey Galleries in Melbourne, I find I have very different feelings about the work. At the time, he was uh, already... Um, over 65 years of age, the obvious difficulty and pain this event causes uh, is difficult to witness. You want to intervene and stop it. Uh, and at the same time, it's striking how generous this gesture is, that he is still committed to this kind of event at this age. He's got nothing to prove as a performance artist, and yet he's committed to the act. It gets me thinking about Hales and the post-human again as she warns Quote, as we rush to explore the new vistas that cyberspace has made available for colonisation, let us remember the fragility of a material world that cannot be replaced. Delac's painful late career re-emergence as a performance artist shows the futility of the discourse of post-biology, that one day the mind will exist in a purely dematerialised informational state, separate from the body which has somehow been rendered obsolete. This is not what Stellark's obsolete body means. He's showing in this event that we can host multiple technologies, entities and possibilities, even in an older body. So on the one hand, our thinking about bodies and their apparent ageing and functional obsolescence needs rethinking. And on the other, the conatus of the human body takes shape in this last of stellar suspensions. In reenacting the suspensions, once again, he shows that as the body ages and becomes both more in need of support and more determined to hold its place in the world, his post-human legacy is materially orientated and grounded in a practice of and through the body. But this was always the goal, to think beyond the human, and so to understand better where its true competencies and capacities lie. In summing up, I'll go back to Bray Dotty, who argues that a post-human ethics must include concerted efforts at experimenting with and actualising potential or virtual options, and a new link between theory and practice, including a central role for creativity. Stellark's flights, an act of post-human mobility, physically expressing the otherwise purely notional modes of corporeal futurity in a, techno in a technological ecology. In doing this, he produces a version of Bredotti's thresholds of sustainability in the production of what she describes as effective cartographies of how much bodies can take. Stillark has mapped this particular post-human ethical terrain as much as any artist in the 20th and 21st centuries and has applied his own body to the task. I think I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. stable constructs, the dead, the near dead, the brain dead, the yet to be born, the partially living, 
and synthetic life form now share a material and proximal existence with other living bodies, operational machines, and execu executable and viral code. We are now dissolving into this circulating information stream of detached biodata embedded in vast machine systems of computational calculation, artificial and alien cognition. The monster is no longer the obsolete stitched up meat body, but the system that sucks the self into virtuality. What it means to be human is perhaps not to remain human at all at a time of digital contamination of the body's microbiome. Bodies now become end defectors of extended operational systems of replicating fractal flesh. Heads are electronically amputated and reconnected. Excess limbs become accessible as remote manipulators and our senses are, are outsourced online. We see and hear with other eyes and with other ears from other places. Bodies become hosts of multiple and remote agents. Phantom flesh proliferates, generating these alternate anatomical architectures. Phantoms now have become increasingly physical. These phantoms are not phantasmatic, but rather they become like phantom limbs. In the liminal spaces of proliferating prosthetic bodies, partial life and artificial life, the body has become a floating signifier. So the hyperhuman is this chimera of hyperlinks, incessantly reconnecting, reconfiguring, and reimagining itself. It is, it is neither all here nor all there, but appearing and disappearing all at once, everywhere else, scaled up, speeded up, performing cinematically, editing and perceiving itself by pausing, rewinding, looping into self-referentiality. Uh, so my experience, uh, first living in Japan, was an experience of excess, uh, excess materiality of the body, um, excess, uh, 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 excess of the alien, um, to the presence, the physical presence of the sumo wrestler, um, the insect and alien dance uh, of, of, of Bhutto, and then the engineering of artificial aliveness uh, with Japanese robotics, uh, with the humanoid robotics and prosthetics of Professor Ichiro Kato at Waseda University, and the biomimicry of uh, 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 Hiroshi Shigeo at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. These projects and performances then are, are all about uh, this kind of excess. Uh, the body in these performances is exposed, is augmented and amplified, and bodies are reimagined. The suspension events uh, are really experiments in bodily sensation expressed in different spaces, in diverse situations. They're not actions for interpretation, nor require any explanation. In fact, they're not meant to generate any meaning at all. Rather, they are sites of indifference and states of erasure. The body is empty and absent to its own agency. The rock suspension uh, in Tokyo, uh, 1982, the body is uh, counterbalanced by a ring of rocks, one rock for each insertion point. Uh, the body's gently swaying from side to side, setting up random oscillations in the rocks. Uh, this performance ended when the telephone rang in the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the suspension 
even then by the seaside was only witnessed by fishing boats that sailed past and by a group of fishermen on another outcrop of rocks. Before we arrived, they were fishing during the performance and they were still fishing when we left. <laughs> One of the few public performances and one of the few suspension performances uh, outside of Japan, most of the suspension performances, and there are about 29 of them, um, were performed in Japan in private gallery spaces or remote locations. This is one of the few public uh, performances um, over East 11th Street in New York. Uh, the body had a good view of the police cars that arrived within about five minutes. Um, and the, I was arrested after this performance, not for a display of public nudity, nor for performing some sadomasochistic act, but rather for being a danger to the public. So in these suspension events, the, the body is an anxious, uncertain, and profoundly obsolete body. Uh, this, this, uh, this performance was done at Art Space in Nagoya, and it was actually uh, run by a previous member of the Gutai performance group in Japan, which was sort of active in, in, the, in the 60s, but whose activities had subsided by the time I arrived. Um, so these performances are about alternate anatomical architectures, reimagining the body, um, having realized its profound biological obsolescence, and then wondering what possibilities there were attaching technology to it. The third hand uh, was done in consultation with uh, Professor Ichiro Kato at Waseda University. Uh, the third hand is a three degree of freedom uh, mechanism and it was actuated by electrodes on my abdominal and leg muscles. Um, in fact, this was sophisticated enough at the time to get invitations from uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena and the Johnson Space Center in Houston to demo the, the third hand to the extravehicular activity group. Initially, the third hand was merely a visual attachment to the body. Um, but I did learn uh, to do um, some other things. Uh, this performance involved writing one word, each hand writing a separate letter at the same time. Uh, with my hands spread out like that, I had to remember every third letter I was writing. So I had to keep my two eyes on what my three hands were doing. And because this performance was done on a sheet of glass between the artists and the audience in the Maki Gallery in Tokyo, um, I had to learn to write the word back to front. A performance with the third hand um, <coughs> amplifying brain waves, heartbeat, blood flow, and muscle signals, acoustically uh, filling and immersing uh, the audience with my internal uh, body sounds. Uh, the laser beams were directed to the eyes with optic fiber cable. So as well as um, extending the body acoustically, uh, you were probing the space uh, visually. This performance began when the body was switched on and the performance ended when the body was switched off. The extended arm uh, was an 11 degree of freedom uh, manipulator. 
this extended my right arm to primate proportions. But whilst my right arm was extended, my left arm was performing involuntarily uh, using uh, a computer controlled muscle stimulation system <laughs> delivering 15 to 50 volts to the different uh, muscle sites. It didn't take much imagination uh, that if you could uh, program the body to move involuntarily in a in a proximal space, you could do this remotely. Uh, this is a muscle stimulation uh, control system. The blue switches indicate which parts of the body could be pre-programmed, and using uh, a touch screen interface by touching uh, the muscles on the computer model. The computer model uh, would simulate uh, your choreography. And uh, a second later in Luxembourg, my body would move involuntarily. Um, so people in the Pompidou Center in Paris, the Media Lab in Helsinki, the Doors of Perception Conference in Amsterdam, were able to remotely access and remotely uh, choreograph the body in another place. Uh, this was actually in 1995. Um, and in this performance, the experience is one of a split body, voltage in on the left side, generating involuntary movements, voltage out on the right side, uh, actuating a third hand. I could see people who were programming uh, my body. I had a head up display so I could see the, the face of the person who was moving me and there were malicious agents out there who were not believing in the system. <laughs> they kept programming the same movement over and over again. The two theories, philosophies that I think are relevant to these projects and performances are uh, Bruno Latour's uh, Act Network Theory um, and uh, Graham Harmon's uh, Object Oriented Ontology. Um, these are both uh, seductive for me because they're both flattened ontologies. Um, Act Network Theory emphasising the differences um, uh, that, that are manifested in the network of relations, uh, whilst uh, object-oriented ontology asserts that the reality of the objects exceeds any relation with humans or even other uh, objects. So both reject the primacy of the human and uh, sort of reassert uh, the animal, the other, uh, the object, and that's what's so seductive about uh, these two theories. The ambidextrous arm is a double-jointed arm actuated by pneumatic rubber muscles, so it's flexible and compliant. Imagine if you were an amputee, um, wouldn't you like to replace your right hand with a hand that is ambidextrous? That is both a left hand and a right hand all in one. Uh, this project has already been initiated at Brunel University uh, in London and we've already done uh, tests. Uh, so uh, you can bend your fingers one way, you can re ro rotate your thumb uh, forwards and you've got a right hand but you completely can bend the fingers in the opposite direction rotate the thumb backwards uh, and you've got an ambidextrous hand. Next, please. As well as uh, manipulators, I've all also been interested in um, a locomotion and mm. I guess uh, uh, looking at the work of Shigeo Hirose at Tokyo Institute uh, of Technology at the time, uh, he was doing work on, for example, um, uh, ex examining the movements uh, of a snake, 
uh, sinusoidal movements of a snake and replicating that in a robot, all the crab-like movements um, in, in his walking machines. And my interest was, was in fact, uh, creating these of neat metal and code. Exoskeleton was a six-legged walking robot um, that um, uh, 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 was engineered in 1997, and it, uh, my arm gestures selected the walking movements of the robot. So position orientation sensors on the upper body exoskeleton allowed me to uh, walk the robot forward with a ripple gait sideways with a tripod gait. Now as well as attaching uh, technology and performing with uh, machines external to the body, in 1993 for the 5th Australian Sculpture Triennale, I decided to design a sculpture for the inside of my body. Um, the theme of the Triennale was in fact site-specific works. <laughs> but instead of a sculpture for a public space, um, this is designed for a private physiological space. Here the body is not uh, a site for the psyche, but is simply a host for a sculpture. Uh, the sculpture was inserted with the help of a friendly endoscopist, uh, about 40 centimetres uh, inside the stomach cavity. Uh, the stomach was inflated with air to make it safe to insert. And I guess this idea of a more intimate relation uh, with our machines, that technology is no longer merely external uh, to the body, is no, no longer merely a container of the body. Uh, here, uh, technology becomes a component, is inserted inside the body. In fact, one might argue that all technology in the future will be invisible because in micro and nano scale, all technology will be inside the human body. Another kind of uh, very different alternate anatomical architecture um, was the Blender project done in collaboration with Nina Sellers and another artist. Uh, we both underwent liposuction to extract 4.6 litres of our biomaterial. Uh, this biomaterial was placed in a container as part of the installation. And the proximity sensors uh, arrayed around the chassis of the installation indicated if anyone approached uh, the blender. Um, this would uh, activate the blender blades mixing the biomaterial from the two artists' bodies. It was anthropomorphic in scale um, about the size of, of, of a human. Um, and the interesting thing with this project is that you might see it as the inverse of the stomach sculpture. Instead of a, 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 a soft organ being the host for a machine choreography, uh, here a machine installation is the host for a liquid body composed of biomaterial from two artists' bodies. So in this increasingly video virtual and vicarious world, the body asserts in, in the, its materiality in unexpected ways. Not as a site for the psyche, no, nor for social inscription, but rather a site that needs to be sculpted. The body not as an object of desire, but rather an object that requires reimagining and even redesigning. 
a body interactively operating in a flattened ontology of machines, microbes, objects, and algorithms. The extra ear idea came about in 1996 when I was at Carnegie Mellon University and first uh, visualized at Curtin University in Perth. Um, the idea here was to engineer a soft prosthesis, um, but having this ear on the side of my head was an anatomically dumb place uh, to have it because of possible uh, partial face paralysis. And it took 10 years to find uh, three surgeons and to get funding for the first uh, surgeries. Um, we inserted a, a, a scaffold, a biomaterial uh, scaffold. Uh, it's called MedPore. This is a porous scaffold. Uh, when you in, uh, insert it beneath the skin, when you suction the skin um, over the scaffold, uh, you get what's, what's the, what, what would be described as tissue ingrowth and vascularization occurring. In other words, the ear becomes uh, fully integrated into your arm. It grows its own blood supply. Um, and this project uh, recently, um, uh, we, we've had, a, this was about four months ago, we did a further surgical procedure to eventually grow a soft earlobe using my adult stem cells. So adipose tissue would be extracted from my body. Uh, stem cells would be uh, filtered from that adipose tissue. Uh, growth hormones added, uh, re-injected um, into, uh, into the vicinity of the, of the earlobe. Um, and over a period of time, a soft earlobe would be grown. But uh, it's not only a matter of constructing an ear on my arm. Rather, the idea is to eventually electronically augment the ear, to internet enable it, to make this ear into a remote listening device for people in other places. Uh, the ear on arm generated other projects and performances. This is the, the lawn uh, biennale, uh, sculpture biennale. Um, I was also asked to do a performance, so I lay on top of the sculpture. My body was um, covered with white slip, white clay. But as I lay on this sculpture, I thought that it would be interesting, perhaps, not only to lie on the sculpture, not only to make this a counterpoint in scale between a whole physical body and a much larger fragment of the body, the, the arm and the ear, but wouldn't it be interesting to suspend the body above the sculpture? And uh, in uh, 2012, um, the ear on arm suspension occurred uh, in Melbourne. Uh, this performance began when the body was hoisted off the sculpture and the performance ended when the body was lowered down. I thought this performance would only go for about five minutes or so. I knew that when the steel cable, which was braided, took the full weight of the body, it would begin to untwist. In untwisting, the body begins to slowly uh, spin around. Um, it spins in one direction uh, and then spins in the other direction. Unfortunately, this performance went for over 15 minutes um, and this was a performance of a body with an ear on its arm suspended over a much larger sculpture uh, which represented this performance. 
uh, that propelled performance uh, several years ago in Perth uh, attaches the body uh, at the end of an industrial robot arm. It was really difficult to pull this performance uh, off because um, if you know anything about industrial robot arms, um, they're considered very dangerous. In fact, you're not even uh, uh, allowed to be within the task envelope of the robot. Uh, the robot can perform at, at lethal speeds. Um, and in fact, uh, just before I did this performance, uh, there was a, a worker in Germany who was accidentally killed by an industrial robot arm when he strayed into its task envelope. Uh, at any rate, uh, I was able to access uh, an industrial robot arm. Um, a support structure attaches my body to the end of it. It's the six degree of freedom robot arm. And um, the body's trajectory, velocity, uh, position, orientation um, can be precisely programmed. But after the uh, choreography of the body on the industrial robot arm, the body is replaced by a body scaled ear. This is a laser scan. Uh, um, of my ear and the interesting thing in this performance is that the robot that choreographs the ear is the same robot that carved the ear. <laughs> uh, the robot effectively was a six degree of freedom uh, CNC machine. Um, the support structure, this minimal support structure that allowed me to be on the robot arm uh, unexpectedly generated this idea of a minimal full body exoskeleton. Uh, the stick man performance uh, makes the body simultaneously a possessed and performing body. And although uh, most of my body, my two arms and one leg, uh, algorithmically actuated by the this exoskeleton musculature uh, for a performance of five hours, I could pivot on my right leg, which meant that I could uh, modulate the video feedback that was projected on the wall, and I could also generate interesting uh, uh, shadows uh, uh, as part of this interplay between the physical presence, the flattened shadow, and the, and the video uh, modulation. We recently engineered a mini stick man, which enables uh, visitors to uh, uh, interrupt and insert their own choreography into the five-hour performance. So for example, by manipulating the limbs of the mini stick man and pressing play, <laughs> uh, their choreography would, would be inserted into the movements of, of the body. In other words, um, a kind of electronic voodoo. So we're in this time of what I call circulating flesh, where we can extract organs from one body and insert them into other bodies, where we can uh, take the hand from a cadaver and reanimate it on the arm of an amputee. It's also a time of prosthetic flesh. Increasingly now, bits of technology are attached and become part of, of, of the body's uh, nervous uh, system. And fractal flesh, and by fractal flesh I mean bodies and bits of bodies spatially separated but electronically connected, generating recurring patterns of interactivity at varying scales. And that's just simply the internet described. <laughs> and also phantom flesh. With phantom flesh, I mean that the body now experiences itself as its phantom. So to others online, these phantoms appear flickering on and off. They appear as kind of digital, digital noise, as kind of 
glitches in biological time. In 2016, at the Perth Institute of Contemporary Art, uh, for five days, uh, six hours every day, I could only see with the eyes of someone in London, whilst only hearing with the ears of someone in New York, but anyone anywhere could access my right arm and make it move involuntarily. Uh, this performance was uh, a performance where you literally outsourced your senses and you shared your agency. In 2011, the first twin turbine heart was inserted into the chest of a terminally ill patient. He only lived long enough um, uh, only for a few days, but it was enough to test this twin turbine heart, which was smaller and more robust and reliable than previous artificial hearts. What's interesting, though, is that it circulates the blood uh, continuously without pulsing. So in the near future, you might rest your head on your loved one's chest their warmth to the touch, their breathing, their sighing, their speaking. They're certainly alive, but they have no heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what artists do best. Uh, they generate contestable futures. Possibilities that can be personally experienced interrogated, evaluated, possibly appropriated, but most likely discarded. Thank you very much.